and welcome to the technical training session on CubeSat prototypes. I'm Stephanie and I'm here with Ted and together we'll answer some of the excellent questions submitted by teams. I'd like to start with a very high level question. Why CubeSat prototypes? It's hard not to notice that everything's space is trending, whether it be exploration and flight on Mars, expansion of satellite constellations for global connectivity, or successful testing of the next commercial spaceflight platform. By introducing a space component to this year's first global challenge, we're opening the discussion to aerospace applications of STEM among our community, especially for the students who will become tomorrow's aerospace experts. There were a few questions that relate to updates in the CubeSat prototype challenge guide that I'd like to share. First, there are three methods that are considered valid for launches, releasing the balloon, tethering the balloon, and elevated placement of the prototype. As part of the mission, teams will deploy their CubeSat prototypes into the lower layers of Earth's atmosphere. This extends from ground level up to approximately 50 kilometers. Weather balloon was provided in the kit for teams to release or tether, but due to varying restrictions on airspace use, teams can use other methods or can take measurements from any high point off the ground. Next is adding and replacing kit components. The kit includes all of the sensors needed for teams to create a complete solution. Teams should keep in mind these three points. You're not required to use all of the sensors in the kit. Two, you may add additional sensors and components to your prototype. For example, adding a GPS unit, solar panels, or additional cameras. And three, teams are allowed to replace components with alternative versions. For example, using a different battery or a different type of microcontroller. Now we'll jump into questions from the teams, um, starting with the MKR1000 microcontroller. What's the best language to use when programming the Arduino microcontroller? So the Arduino microcontrollers um, all use the Arduino IDE, which uses C++, uh, which would be the ideal programming language for it. Um, you can code right on the IDE in your computer and upload it directly to the Arduino with the USB cable that we provide. Okay, next a question on just sensors in general. What steps can teams take to guarantee that the CubeSat prototype is working before they launch it? And how can they check if it's working after they deploy it? Before launch, it's important to rigorously test your, your code and your devices. For example, check to make sure everything is appearing properly in the serial monitor and the IDE, as well as leave your CubeSat alone um, for maybe a few hours and check to see that the data is still collecting. Once you've launched it, there's not much you can do to make sure that everything is going smoothly. So it's important to test as much as you can before that launch so that everything goes smoothly. Okay. Should the sensors be on the interior or the exterior of the structure of the enclosure? And if so, which ones? Most sensors should be on the interior so that they can be insulated, but there's a few sensors where it may be important to, that they have access to the outside environment. For example, the UV sensor needs to be able to detect the UV rays. The smaller temperature sensor can get a more accurate reading of the atmosphere when it's not inside a box, as well as the, the Grove particle sensor needs um, access with the fan to airflow so that it can detect the particles in the air. Okay, and speaking of the laser particle sensor that manufactured by Grove, um, it does not come with a suitable connector to install, and how can we connect it? So the Grove particle sensor comes with this female to female um, cable that plugs right in. And although it's not ideal, our provided jumper cables will connect into the, um, into the cable as such. But um, if the cable needs to be shortened or cleaned up in any way, these cables can also be cut and soldered to um, any other jumper cables or wiring. Okay. And regarding the same sensor, how do I read the data from this sensor in the serial monitor? So I'll try to share my screen. So the output, the output from the Grove sensor has um, a little bit of confusing numbers. There's essentially um, a matrix of here's it zeros, nines, and Ds at the top. But then the only things that we really care about are these uh, concentration, these six concentrations in the bottom portion, where it's the 
PM 1.0, 2.5, and 1.0 concentration. And this, the, the junk at the top can be excluded from the code and the full code on the uh, first global slash CubeSat website um, has a more refined version for the sensor. Our next questions are about the camera. Why does the ArduCam get hot or overheat when turned on? And how can we prevent this from happening or dissipate the heat? So sometimes with the ArduCam, um, there's this large heat sink towards the back. And if that has too much, um, too much other stuff crowded around it in your situation, then it may overheat, which may cause the camera to fail. Additionally, um, I've seen other problems with the ArduCam overheating when, um, when being powered by five volts, um, which would be the powering from your computer with the MCAR 1000. Whereas if you power using the, the 3.7 volt battery, there should be less thermal issues for the camera. Okay. Uh, what can you tell teams about how to get the best image, whether it's photo quality, putting it in focus, getting the best resolution? So for different focuses for the ArduCam, this, uh, this lens here can just be twisted manually, either inside or out to change the focus. But once you have that set, it's a good idea to either not touch the camera or hold it down somehow with tape or glue. And as far as getting the best quality image, um, it's important that your CubeSat stays relatively stable so that the camera is not shaky and blurry but additionally, the camera has multiple resolution options, um, which can be seen on the product webpage and in some other example codes that are not included with our guides. Okay, our next questions are regarding the weather balloon provided in the kit. To what altitude will the weather balloon take our CubeSat prototype? These 300 gram weather balloons that we provide in the kits, um, can go to roughly 20,000 to 30,000 meters, but it mostly depends on the weight of your payload and how much helium you're using. Okay, and that leads right to our next question. What gas should we use to fill the balloon and how much will we need? Helium is commonly used um, because it's safer than hydrogen and also in most cases easier to find, but hydrogen is also a possibility if you may not be able to find helium where you are. Um, they both should work equally well for lifting your payload. And there are also online calculators to determine how much helium you should use to fill your balloon, um, which we've included in the weather balloon and launch guide. Great, and another question, how do we pop or deflate the weather balloon? Once the weather balloon reaches a high enough altitude, um, it will expand too much because of the decreased pressure and will pop automatically and start the descent of your CubeSat. Okay. Now on to launch and retrieval. What considerations should teams have to ensure the recovery of the CubeSat prototype? To plan your launch and ensure a good recovery, it's a good idea to use the prediction calculators, um, which you can choose a launch spot and it will give you an estimated landing of your CubeSat, but for Ideal purposes, it's a good idea, if possible, to use a, a GPS inside the CubeSat so you can accurately track where it is. Okay, and I know that GPS units, sometimes you can buy them as standalone units, or um, you could even use a cell phone as your GPS unit and add that. Um, next question is, what is the best weather to launch a CubeSat prototype? So to launch the CubeSat prototype, you want light winds because you don't want it to drift too far from where you're launching it. Um, this would be roughly less than six knots of wind. And you also don't want any hazardous weather conditions that may, um, that may cause issues for you, such as lots of heavy rain or thunderstorms or anything that would cause your balloon to either burst prematurely or cause your sensors to be damaged. Okay. Where is the best place to launch it and how can we predict where it will land? The best place to launch your CubeSat would be an open area so you have plenty of space to fill up the balloon and you should check Sky Vector to see that it's a suitable spot for you to launch. 
as well as a suitable place to recover your balloon wherever it lands. We have multiple calculators and predictors linked in the, the launch guide to plan where your balloon will land and plan a ideal landing point or ideal starting point. And additionally, there are methods for de delaying your parachute deployment so that it doesn't drift as far as it would if the parachute deployed immediately after the balloon bursts. Okay. How do we find and retrieve our prototype? Besides using the, the websites which will predict your landing point, which is only a prediction, the, the best way would be using GPS tracking. Although if you're using a tethered balloon, it's much simpler and it may be low enough where you could use binoculars. Okay. And just a reminder to teams to make sure you have authorization from your local authorities to launch your weather balloon. Remember, there are other ways to deploy the prototype than releasing the balloon if that's something you're not allowed to do. Also, if for some reason you're unable to retrieve the prototype or its data, say you can't find where it landed or it, it ended up in a dangerous area where you can't go to retrieve it, make sure your contact information is clearly labeled on it and that it is a part of a student experiment. Um, and then when you're doing your submission write-up, make sure to tell us about what happened and what you learned from it. The next questions are on parachute and descent. Um, updated in the manual is to let teams know that they can add aerodynamic control surfaces to help control the descent and prevent the prototype from spinning, which as Ted mentioned earlier, will help stabilize the camera images. One of the questions we got was how big should the parachute be? So the size of the parachute will depend on how large your payload is. So once you have your payload finalized, you can weigh that and then decide on a parachute to use. For example, a one kilogram payload would require an approximately one and a half meter diameter parachute. And we have descent charts in our launch guide, which will help you decide which parachute to get. Okay. We had some other questions on communication. And while we did not provide methods for live communication in the kit, there are um, items out there that you could add to your prototypes. Uh, so the question that came in is, is there another way to retrieve the data other than by recovering the prototype after it lands? So besides recording the data to the micro SD card, there is a method of obtaining the live readings from the prototype by using a different microcontroller. One example is the Arduino MKR1310 microcontroller, which adds LoRa connectivity, which stands for long range. By adding a transmitting antenna on the prototype and a receiving antenna on your ground station, the prototype should be able to send live readings at lower altitudes. Our next questions are on the enclosure for the CubeSat prototype. So just an update that was made to the manual, the outer dimensions of the CubeSat prototype must be the standardized CubeSat size of 10 cubic centimeters, which includes the enclosure materials itself. The battery, microcontroller, and the sensors provided in the kit must all be within that enclosure. Other components, including the parachute, balloon attachments, insulation, flotation, a GPS location device, antennas, aerodynamic control surfaces, and any additional cameras beyond the provided ArduCam can all be outside that 10 cubic centimeter footprint. Uh, one of the questions we received from teams is what materials can we use to make the enclosure and what do you recommend? Teams can use any material that they choose to make the enclosure, but we recommend mostly lightweight materials so that um, you keep your payload weight down and your ideal lift up. So we recommend aluminum, rigid foam, or it could be 3D printed, made out of cardboard, any material that the team chooses. Okay. Is it necessary to have thermal insulation for the CubeSat prototype? Some of the sensors do require insulation and others don't. For example, the battery will um, start failing at, higher, or at lower temperatures as well as the camera, um, but other sensors such as the temperature sensor can can sense very low temperatures without insulation. So we recommend um, insulation and sometimes heating for your, your inner payload, but you may have sensors outside of that. For example, temperatures at 20,000 meters can be negative 57 degrees Celsius, which is a very large difference than you would be testing the sensors with on the ground. Okay. What are the benefits of holes or cutouts in the enclosure walls? In the enclosure's walls, you may want 
holes so that your camera can poke through, as well as you may want holes for airflow if your camera is overheating. And additionally, other sensors may need access to the outside, such as your UV sensor um, or your temperature sensor, atmospheric pressure sensor. Okay. How can electronics be mounted to the enclosure? Some of the electronics have small mounting holes on the corners, which can be used, but a very simple solution is just double-sided tape, such as 3M VHB tape or any sort of um, foam tape like that. Our final question is on the processing software. Um, are there tutorials online to help us get a better understanding of how to work with processing software for data visualization? The processing website has tons of great tutorials going way beyond what we've included in, in our guide. Um, so it would definitely be a good idea to go further with that and continue with your learning. Okay, thank you, Ted. That concludes the CubeSat prototype technical training session. Thank you so much for joining us and we can't wait to see your submissions.